<laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to our first React meeting meetup online. I'm Eva, and I am operations manager at the Stott Labs, and I am very excited to do this. Um, our sponsor today is the Stott Labs. We are a tech consultancy, so if you need any help with Java, a JavaScript front-end stuff, we would love to help you. Give us a call or an email or a DM. A um, little bit of announcements before we get started today. Uh, we have a bunch of upcoming events that I'd love to let you guys know about. Uh, this dot JavaScript State of Frameworks is coming up on August 13th. Our first view online is coming up on August 15th. Web Components Online is going to be August 22nd. And then we have a Modern Web Online uh, coming up on September 3rd. Our two speakers today are going to be Kent and Taylor. Um, and Kent will go first. So schedule of events. Um, Kent's going to give his talk first on React Hook pitfalls. And then Taylor is going to go next uh, with building accessible UI with React. And then we'll have some closing notes and say goodbye. So let me get out of my slides, and Kent, you can take it away. All right, sweet. Let me share my screen here. And my computer froze. Oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> Man. Um, oh, shoot. I, I'm going to have to reboot. This happens sometimes because Tim Cook doesn't know how to make a, a MacBook. But... Um, so yeah, so I'm going to have to reboot. Maybe Taylor can go first or, or Ben can tell some jokes and I'll be back as soon as I reboot. Sorry. I'm just, I'm just fascinated that, that Tim Cook hand builds your, your MacBooks. That's impressive. Well, I mean, it should only take like a minute, right? Uh, yeah, it, it's, well, um, I'm probably going to switch Zoom to my streaming PC, which might take a second. So, um, but if you want to wait, that's fine too. So I'll be as quick as I can. Ben, do you want to tell jokes? Uh, not right now. The only joke I can think of is one that my son says it's mildly inappropriate. I don't, I don't think I'll do that. <laughs> but no, um, so we're, 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 I got asked to do this last minute, uh, which uh, because I think Tracy had a scheduling conflict. Is that right? Do we know what Tracy's doing? Yep, Tracy had a scheduling conflict. So. Yeah. So I, I, I am unprepared with jokes. Usually what happens for these meetups is about a day in advance. Well, no, that's, that's giving too much credit. Probably like two hours or three hours in advance, Tracy will be like, oh my God, Ben, come up with a bunch of puns for Je Jeopardy or whatever, whatever funny shtick she's, she's going to do. Um, and then I have to spend like two hours trying to come up with like 10 puns around, you know, cows and JavaScript or something weird, um, which is utterly ridiculous, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I can milk this for, for that long. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's the, that's the, the, the usual shtick. So I am, I am not as prepared as I normally would be with, with my Tracy sanctioned shenanigans. How if anyone else has a joke, I'd love to hear it. Yes. <laughs> Taylor, any jokes? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> um, no, not any. At least not any that are G-rated <laughs> or appropriate. So, yeah. <laughs> She's got the same problem I do. Yeah, like my future employer could be seeing this, you know. <laughs> like, uh, developer advocate, you will not be Taylor if I say this joke, so. Right, right. Um, We've got somebody in the audience who wants to tell a joke. Wilfred? Uh, yeah, hey everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm not big on jokes. Uh, we had um, trouble with our video conference uh, during our company stand-ups. And yeah, someone had to tell a joke similar to this situation. And uh, yeah, so what did zero tell eight? Uh, nice tie you have. Nice, nice tie you have. I don't know if I get that one. I don't get it either. I, I get it. it. So kind of like uh, zero, zero is similar to eight, except like yeah. zero, eight but is like 
Okay. It's a zero. I've been tied in a knot. I get it. That's good. Mm-hmm. I like it. I had yeah. to think about it too much there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was a lame joke when I first said it, but yeah, after some time, you're like, oh yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> Hello. Can anyone hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Here. Awesome. Is that Dante? Yes, this is Dante. Hi. Hi. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Hi, Sweet. My name that cool. <laughs> <laughs> Then again, oh right God. now, my name is Tracy Lee, so I don't even know. Oh, that's TL. I like that. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad I made it. I almost messed up because of the time zone. And then I tried to join on the computer. Then my computer froze because I bought like a um, $100 HP oh, laptop from the pawn shop like two years ago. And it just like was not being right. And I was just like, let me be great. So I'm having <laughs> Um, Android that's probably gonna die eventually because it's just a hot right, man. But so, we here. That's all that matters. Here, yes. Yes. Fly from Mexico, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. from the sun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it. Finally, we not, we not in person, in person, but we here yeah. though. We close. We getting closer. We're getting close. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe next time you'll be giving a talk for this side. Girl, my, did you see me try to give a tortilla? Look, I just tried to do a um, flour tortilla tutorial yesterday <laughs> on my on my um my Twitter. I don't. I burned my fingers. I was sweating. I'm always sweating in my video. Yeah. Mexico just won't let me be cute, and I sweat. <laughs> I, I think I would. I think I would burn my fingers just trying to say flour tortilla. To flour tortilla tutorial. <laughs> I can I could even get it out once. <laughs> no, just, just what you have to say it in Spanish. Okay. All right, all right. Can't can't see Dodds. I want you to say flour tortilla tutorial as fast as you can go. Oh, your, your mic's off. No That's sound. a good thing because uh, it didn't sound very good. <laughs> flour tortilla tutorial. T- t- no. <laughs> <laughs> so good. It's so good. All right. That's my new favorite tongue twister. Hello, uh, Katia Tutorial. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, I guess we're, um, we're back up and running with me then, right? Yep. It's all okay, you. Okay, cool. Sorry, let me just fix my screen resolution here really quick on this thing. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. I, I just... I wasn't thinking about it. This is actually what I had to do for all of my uh, remote workshops too. And I just, I didn't think about the fact that I was doing the same thing with Zoom. So we should be set now. We good? Yes. Okay, cool. Hi everyone. So, uh, and I've got a different background that has my KCD workshops hashtag there. So this isn't a, a workshop, but there you go. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to be talking about React Hook pitfalls. Uh, I've been using React for uh, React hooks for a couple months, and um, at first you're like, "Oh, this is amazing," but then the honeymoon is over, and you're like, "Oh, real world, this is hard." Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about. Some of that stuff. I've got a bunch of links about me here. I'm not going to belabor all of those. Um, and yeah, so you can take a look at this later. I've got a link to these quote unquote slides uh, at the end of the presentation so you can uh, take a look at that. And actually, while I'm doing that, if anybody w- just wants to follow along, I'll just grab that and put it in the chat here really quick um, because people f- might find that interesting. There we go. Cool, so um, yeah, we're gonna be exploring some common mistakes people make when they're learning and adopting React hooks and help hopefully help you all make or be better at using React hooks. I'm not really here to convince you that you should be, but you should. Um, and hopefully I don't convince you that you should not because you should. <laughs> so um, yeah, we'll just jump right into it. Pitfall number one, um, not starting with a good foundation. So I just super like, I know that a lot of people just like to dive in and mess around with the API and that's fine if you want to do it that way. Um, but I really strongly recommend that at some point you read the docs for real. So these are the docs, reactjs.org. 
slash hooks. It will take you here. Um, and it explains uh, the hooks conceptually really well as, as well as the API. Um, and I strongly encourage you to not skip the video introduction. Um, it will help you get a clear understanding of why hooks uh, came to be and, uh, and some of the cool things that you can get out of hooks. So yeah, definitely go through all of this. Um, you've got a whole bunch of uh, articles about um, the different hooks. Just go through uh, each one of these and especially the hooks FAQ, F-A-Q, Frequently Asked Questions. Um, I can't tell you how many times somebody asked me a question on Twitter and I just send them to the FAQ. Uh, I'm like, that's a really good question. In fact, it's such a good question that you might say it's frequently asked. <laughs> um, and so it, it's all here on, uh, in the FAQ. Really strongly recommend you read through all of this. It should only take you like two hours and it'll save you a lot more time. So um, read the docs. That's pitfall number one. I see a lot of people just kind of skipping over that. Um, so read it, read it again um, if you have read it already because they continue to be updated. Okay, so pitfall number two not using or ignoring the ESLint plugin. So uh, I forgot to open up a tab for this, but there's a plugin called ESLint uh, plugin React Hooks that you can take a look at. And I'll stick that right here to you. Bing, 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 bing. That's, the, that's the thing, ESLint plugin React Hooks. And by default, it has, uh, well, it has two rules uh, that it exposes. Uh, I'm guessing those are gonna be the only two that they ever really expose. Um, but one is called rules of hooks, and that is um, they recommend an error for that one. And exhaustive depths, they recommend a warning for that one. The only reason they recommend a warning for the exhaust exhaustive depths rule is because static code analysis tools aren't quite good enough um, to, uh, to make sure that they always catch or, or that they're not giving you some false positives on uh, breakages of that rule. Um, just because static code analysis tools, as amazing as they are, um, are a little bit limited. Um, and specifically, I'm talking about ESLint here. Um, if they were a little bit better, then they could make this an error because uh, this is one rule that you, I really strongly recommend you don't break. Uh, so we're going to look at a little demo here to show you why it's important that you don't break these rules. So I have a dog picker here and I can go to the poodle and it tells me information about the, the pool, poodle and I can go to each one of these dogs and it gives me info about those dogs. So the way that this works is I have this dog list that we're seeing right here and then we have this dog info component and in here um, we're using react use effect and um, the second argument to use effect is your dependency array and this um, is actually breaking um, the exhaustive depths rule. This is something that I see a lot. People say, well, I only want to make this request to get the dog information um, on mount. I have no reason to make that request any time later. So I'll just put an empty um, array here and then I'll disable that ESLint rule because ESLint, you know, Dan doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, I only want this to happen on mount. When in actuality, um, like in, in reality, you should be putting the dog ID in there, but you're like, ah, oh, it's only on mount. Um, so here's where this can be a problem. So let's say that uh, somewhere down the line, you come here and you add a new feature and you say uh, related dogs. So now you can um, uh, choose dogs that are related, like a Bernadoodle is a mix between a Bernese mountain dog and a poodle, happens to be the same breed as my dog wonderful breed. And, uh, and so now, um, like I can go straight from one dog page to another, and it will re-render the dog info page, uh, or the dog info component with a new dog ID. So if I click on Poodle, then nothing happens. You'll notice the URL is actually changing. Um, I click on Bernese Mountain Dog, that URL changes again. But I'm not getting a re-render of this component. Well, actually, I am getting a re-render of this component. Um, but because I have set up this use effect to only run on mount, uh, when that dog ID changes, my um, side effects aren't synchronized with that state change, and therefore I don't go and fetch that new dog and update the state appropriately. So uh, that's just one example. There are lots of um, more nuanced examples of situations where um, you can really mess things up if uh, you don't... Um, 
get do things quite right with uh, the dependencies array. So do not ignore that ESLint rule. I strongly advise that you uh, that you follow that rule. So now if we add that dog ID in here, then we can go poodle and burn a duel and everything is working magically uh, like we want it to. Um, so don't break that rule. There are some situations um, because our uh, linting plugin is kind of limited. There are some situations where um, the ESLint plugin can't tell you whether or not um, you're like breaking a rule. For example, if we had, um, you know, some uh, like maybe we extracted this into a variable called array, um, and I don't know, let array here, whatever. So we're gonna get a, a warning for that um, right here. It was uh, passed a dependency list that is not an array literal. This means we can't statically verify whether you've passed the correct dependencies. So um, I strongly advise focusing on explicitness over cleverness. And so don't try to do like a object dot values you know, and, and pass that in or whatever. Uh, don't do anything clever, just like literally list every step in or that you need here. And it can be a really long list, that's fine. Um, just focus on um, being explicit and React will make sure that what should happen will happen and that's what, uh, what you want. Uh, so strongly advise you don't break that. Uh, and, and then like 1% of the time you can ignore the rule um, with the ESLint ignore, um, but 99% of the time try really hard to make it so that your, uh, your code works um, with the rule enabled. Um, okay, so that's pitfall number tool, uh, number two. <laughs> Follow the tool. <laughs> um, yeah, stick stick with uh, the ESLint plugin React hooks, and you'll be a lot better off. Uh, okay, so pitfall number three. This is a big one. So we've got a bunch of examples, um, but thinking in life cycles. So for uh, as long as React has been around, we've had um, what's called the component life cycle. And um, it has taken different forms, like we had React Create Class years ago. Now we have um, React Component and Class Components. Um, but in whatever form it was, you always had this idea of these life cycles where you have some initialization phase, that's our constructor, and then you have Componented Mount. So this, you run this code when the component is first added to the page, run this code when the component is updated with Componented Update and then run this code right before the component is removed from the page. Uh, and then of course you have your render method to, um, to return React elements, uh, which is gonna be called um, on mount and on every update. So um, it what was nice about this is it made it really, uh, it was kind of a declarative way for us to, um, to say, hey, React, I don't care about like um, updating the DOM or whatever, you, you do that, but when you do, I want you to um, to call me so I can synchronize the state of the world with um, with whatever's happened here, um, and so it was nice. But um, trying to apply this to React hooks um, is a path to darkness, and I will show you an example of that here in a second. So uh, things have changed uh, with hooks. This is uh, the way that you should be thinking about things with hooks uh, is instead of um, thinking about life cycles and when your code should run based off of the life cycle of the component, you should think about synchronizing the state of the world with the state of this component. So here's a, an example where we have use effects with um, these dependencies. And so you say, hey, I want you to uh, run this callback whenever uh, any of these dependencies change because that um, that means that this the state of the side effect, whatever it is, local storage or an HTTP request of some kind or whatever it is, that state is not synchronized. It's, it's fallen out of date with whatever the state of this component is um, and what, what these values are. Uh, and then between every single one of these, um, these side effect changes, I also need to do some cleanup because I set up some event handlers here and now that DOM node has changed. So now I got to tear down those and set up these new ones on that new DOM node, whatever the case may be. Uh, and then the the default of use effect is no dependencies, and this is just like run this and run my cleanup on every single re-render. Uh, the nice thing about this default is that um, you'll never be wrong 
uh, you might be it might be suboptimal for performance, but you'll never be wrong um, with uh, with using no uh, no dependencies, uh, which is cool. But typically, you're going to probably want dependencies, uh, especially when it's um, yeah. There's there are certain situations where having dependencies is like really the only way to to make it work. Um, and then it, like any time you have an empty array of dependencies for use effect. Um, you, you, if you have anything inside of the use effect that um, is based on like props or state, then that can get stale. Um, but if there's nothing inside of here that's based on props or state, then it, there's no way for it to get stale because it legitimately has no dependencies um, on the outside world. So uh, this is a tweet from Ryan Florence that I wanted to share. Uh, so the question is not whether uh, is not when does this effect run. The question is with which state does this effect synchronize with. He uses the word with twice, but I think you get the picture. So uh, if you use use effect with no dependencies, then that's all state. Any changes this needs to synchronize with any of those changes. Um, if there's no uh, dependencies, then no state. This doesn't synchronize with any change that happens in the in the state of the world. Um, and then if you provide um, dependencies and this synchronizes with these specific elements of state. Really important. Uh, so what we're going to do here is play a game. I want you to um, find the bug for me. So we've got this dog info component. Uh, we're managing state here. We're going to just ignore the error and loading states for brevity here, but uh, we have our dog um, state. And then in component and mount, we're going to go fetch the dog uh, based on the dog ID and then update that state. Then we render that. So just take a second and try to identify the bug. You don't have to respond, but um, I'm going to give you just a second to look at this and see if you can figure it out before I move on, which I'm going to do right now. So the bug is, what happens if the um, dog ID changes? Well, we have that same bug that we had in, in our previous demo on Code Sandbox. So uh, we're not handling the dog ID changing, so let's go ahead and do that. So um, we've moved the uh, fetch logic into a, a method that we can call in component did mount. And on component did update, we'll check the previous dog ID with the next one or with our, our new one. And if it's different, then we're going to call fetch dog again so we can fetch uh, that dog ID. Uh, great. So actually, there's another bug. Um, so see if you can find the other bug in here. So the other bug is what happens if, uh, <clears throat> um, if this component is unmounted between the time that we uh, make the request and the time the request comes back. So you're going to get this warning right here. Can't call set state or force update on an unmounted component. It's a no-op. It indicates a memory leak. Uh, fix that problem. So. Um, that's where we bring in our abort controller so we can um, cancel that request, uh, save some cycles on, on the phone or whatever that's running this code. Uh, so now we have to have this controller, um, and we set that up in our fetch dog. And then on component, we'll unmount. We uh, call abort on our abort controller so we cancel that request. Cool. So that's... Um, that's it. Oh, and also we have to handle the, the error because if it's aborted, then it's going to go through the, the promise chain. Um, really frustrates me that you can't cancel promise chains. Um, maybe I should be using Rx. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to say anything. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was just kind of marveling at, at the infrastructure around this. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, there's actually one more bug in here. Um, so what happens? what happens if... We make a request, and then before the request comes, the response comes back, the dog ID changes. And then we make that request, but due to latency things or whatever, the second request comes back first, and then the first request comes back, and now you've got the wrong do dog stuff. Um, or even if that's not the case, you're, you're processing all the JSON that's coming back from that first request unnecessarily, so you want to cancel that too. And so we're going to handle that as well. Um, where we'll just put this in fetch dog, where if there is a current controller, then we'll call abort on that current controller. Um, so that way we're not, uh, we don't have multiple requests in flight. Um, so that is how we solve this problem. Let me bump that font size down so we can see more of this component here. So um, we have this fetch dog, 
which uh, handles the abort controller so that we don't have multiple uh, fetches going on at the same time. Um, we call that in component did mount and in component did update if the uh, this stuff is updated. And component will unmount, uh, we abort the request if there uh, is one in flight. In fact, this should probably be something like if there's a controller, then we'll do that. So with that, Let's take a look at, and, and like with all that context, um, I want to rewrite this using hooks in the mindset of uh, lifecycle methods, okay? So if you're still thinking about hooks uh, and React components in uh, lifecycle methods, then this might be something, uh, the kind of thing that, uh, that you might create. So uh, for the controller, we don't have instances anymore, so we can't make an instance property on our dog info. So we're going to use a ref, controller ref, and, um, and then we have our state for our dog, and we have this fetch dog. We're doing pretty much the same thing in fetch dog. If there is a current controller, then we'll abort it, uh, and then we'll uh, set the current um, for that controller ref to a new abort controller. We'll pass that along to the set dog, uh, and then when that comes back, we'll set the dog and handle the error just like we were before. So there's not too much different there. So then here we're applying hooks to uh, life cycles. So did mount, we'll fetch the dog, did update. Um, well, we, React doesn't uh, do previous for us. So we can write like a four line hook for this uh, custom use previous thing. So we can get the previous dog ID. And um, on every update, we're going, uh, we're, we wrote this like small three line um, hook here for use update. So it only calls our callback on updates. Um, there, this totally exists on NPM at least like six times. Uh, so don't use it, um, but you could find it if you want to. Um, but uh, yeah, so when our component updates, if the IDs change, then we'll call fetch dog. And um, on unmount, so we'll do an effect that has no dependencies, and we'll just return a cleanup um, to, uh, to abort the request. So that's applying our previous knowledge of life cycles to hooks. And this is a mistake, and I'll show you why because this is all that it takes with hooks. It's so much um, simpler with hooks. We don't need use ref uh, because this is all like closure variables. Um, we just return controller.abort and that handles the update case as well as the unmount case. So hooks are all about synchronizing our side effects with the state change. The state change here is the dog ID. So anytime that changes, we're gonna be calling our cleanup and then we'll call our new effect um, and also when the component is unmount, our cleanup will be called as well. So we are always able to clean up our, uh, the side effects um, with, the, um, uh, with hooks. It just happens. That's how it works. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just infinitely simpler. And so a, a huge takeaway here on this pitfall is just try really hard to not think about component life cycles and instead think about synchronizing side effects with state. So that is pitfall number three. Pitfall number four, um, overthinking performance. So here we have a yo-yo, like I, I just looked on my desk for an example and that's, that's where the yo-yo came from. So here's our example. We've got a screen of yo-yo uh, and then this yo-yo info. So this um, yo-yo screen takes a yo-yo ID and we have this like imaginary custom use async hook uh, that manages all the loading state and everything for us, gives us back the data error and loading. So then um, here we have loading. Uh, if it's loading, then we'll do loading. If it's an error, then we say, oh no. Otherwise we'll render out the yo-yo info. Okay, so with that, um, something that people um, tend to worry a little bit about when they start using hooks is they see this function and they see that it's going to be redefined on every single re-render and passed to yo-yo info, meaning that if yo-yo info were a pure component or it implemented should component update or if it um, was using react.memo, um, that the memoization just wouldn't make any difference because um, we're um, redefining this function every single time. Uh, and that is uh, potentially problematic and it's a little bit worrisome. And so the, the way that you can solve this is by using React use callback and that will memoize the callback so it is consistent um, so long as the yo-yo ID doesn't change. Um, 
And so that is like maybe slightly better for performance, but like maybe it's not. Um, what actually you're doing here is, um, first of all, the yo-yo info would have to be a pure component or use react.memo to even take advantage of this use callback uh, change here. Um, and uh, it is pretty likely that it doesn't need to be a, a pure component. React is very, very fast. And even if a component is re-rendered, that doesn't mean that the DOM is going to get updated. Um, re-renders are different from DOM updates. DOM updates are called commits. And React is very efficient at updating the DOM. Um, but if you have an unnecessary re-render, that doesn't necessarily mean that the DOM is going to get updated. Um, and so it's unlikely to be a performance problem anyway. So like using React.memo uh, could potentially be a waste. And in that scenario, this is actually worse uh, than the previous example because um, react.useCallback is a, an additional function call. It's um, keeping the function around um, for memoization purposes. You're instantiating an array, and you're actually still defining a function on every single render of, uh, of this component. So you're, you're actually um, using more memory um, with this code. Now, again, this is all like super um, pre-optimization. Um, or premature optimization that I wouldn't recommend. Uh, and so instead of just saying, OK, we're going to use React use callback everywhere because we're all of our components are pure components. We don't want to mess those up. Um, that's a mistake, because it actually makes the, co the code more complicated as well. Because um, what happens if you miss the dependencies? Well, now you have a, a callback that has a stale uh, closure. And uh, your yo-yo ID is going to be the, the one that it always was from the beginning. So you just open yourself up to more potential problems um, by doing this. So I recommend that um, you avoid use callback um, and use memo unless it's uh, absolutely necessary. And if you want to learn about the times when it is necessary, um, then actually I've got it right here. I've got this blog post that will explain to you uh, situations when it is necessary. Um, so that is our pitfall number four, is overthinking performance. React is very fast. It's fast by default. Um, you're you're going to be fine. Everything's going to be OK. OK, so for our last pitfall, before I wrap up, um, overthinking the testing of hooks. So um, yeah, so testing hooks it actually should be just like testing classes. The problem is, uh, if you've been testing classes a certain way, then you you could be in a bit of a world of hurt in um, refactoring your code bases to use hooks. So um, here's an example, like pretty typical of, of using Enzyme to test an accordion. Um, so we want to uh, verify that the state of the accordion starts out with an open index of zero. And then if I call the set open index function, that it updates that state. Um, so um, that works. It verifies the internal workings of the accordion, but it's a huge implementation detail test. And if we rewrite our, um, our code to use hooks, then you no longer have an instance of that function component, and you no longer have a state uh, property or even any uh, methods on any instance uh, to call. So this whole test needs to be thrown away and rewritten. However, if you write your test differently, um, and focus less on implementation details and more on um, like how the user is going to use your uh, component, um, then your uh, test should work whether you're using hooks or class components. So this is using React Testing Library. Uh, we render the accordion, and then um, we can get um, one of the accordion items by its uh, title and click on that, and we verify that uh, the right contents are showing or not showing. Um, and so if the pitfall, uh, pitfall number five is overthinking testing of hooks, I guess more uh, like a better term for this would be uh, testing implementation details. And if you avoid testing implementation details, then your test should work even as you refactor uh, your class components to hooks. Um, and I've got a whole bunch of blog posts about this that I'll just show you really quick so you recognize the images here. Uh, so I have this blog post, React Hooks, What's Going to Happen My Tests, and a blog post about what implementation details are and why they're bad for testing. 
um, and also how to know what to test, which is also uh, quite helpful. And if you really want to get into testing uh, the right way, then testingjavascript.com is um, my flawless guide to flawless testing, uh, the smart, efficient way to test any JavaScript app. And it's huge. It's got tons of stuff on here. That you can learn everything that you want to know about testing. So, and I'm actually in the process of updating it to add um, testing server backends, like uh, node backends, um, and it's going to be great. So look forward to that. But if you really want to get into that um, and make sure that you're confident in your applications, then testingjavascript.com will help you a lot. Um, OK, so just as I wrap up here, a couple of resources. Don't forget, the React docs are so good. So totally look at the React docs. Um, I also have this playlist on Egghead.io called React Hooks and Suspense um, that you can go learn about um, learn about that stuff, which is kind of interesting. This is all free with the exception of this one video. So the rest of them are all free. Um, and then this one is for subscribers only. Simplify React apps with React Hooks. This will show you how to refactor class components to hooks. Um, and yeah. And then here's, here's the answer to common questions that I get. <laughs> so other than that, um, yeah. And the, I just got a question in the chat. Does testingjavascript.com include testing with React Testing Library? Yes, it does. Um, yep, it does indeed. Um, OK, yeah, that's it. So here are my slides. Um, Feel free to take a look at those, and you have all the links and everything. I hope that's helpful for you. React is amazing. It is so, so good. Uh, React Hooks, um, they really made some things that I thought were perfect even better. Um, and so I'm really happy with Hooks. Um, there are pitfalls. It is a bit of an unlearning curve if you're used to React already. Um, but if you do some of the things that I explained in this um, talk, then you'll be pretty well off. So. Yeah, um, and I'm getting questions about this content, so let me just copy and paste this over here really quick. So Eva, just out of curiosity, are we, we gonna do questions for Kent now, or are we gonna do questions for uh, both at the end? Let's do questions for Kent now. I think it makes a little more sense, okay. given that his talk is fresh in everybody's mind. Sure, However, sure. I was realizing during his talk that I never properly introduced you, so let me do a quick introduction too for those of you who don't know, this is Ben Lesh. Um, he's one of the co-founders of this dot and um, one of the maintainers for ArcGIS. Anything else you want people to know about you, Ben? Uh, sure, yeah, I was on the Angular team for a little more than a year, like a year and a half or so. Uh, formerly Google, formerly Netflix. I did React development at Netflix. And uh, now I work for a company called uh, Citadel Securities with Jay Phelps and uh, Ken Wheeler doing React development. So um, I'm, in a, I'm in a weird spot in that I used React when it was really new. Uh, and then, you know, of course, I was on the Angular team. So I used a lot of Angular. And then now I'm back to doing React development after a lot of things have changed uh, over mm. time. So I've got this is it's it's a fantastic presentation, Kent. I'm, I really enjoyed it. I, I actually have a couple questions. Cool. So uh, one of the questions I have is I frequently see uh, people using like React dot, uh, they, they, they'll just import like all of React and they'll say React dot use effect, React dot use state, whatever. Um, and my, my concern about that is, you know, being, having a job in the, just recently where I was obsessed with like bundle size and whatever is like does, uh, the default setup for like React, uh, create React app, will that tree shake off all of the other React things in the, in the case that you're saying React dot Whatever yeah, I'm accessing so, it like a property? Um, that's a great question. So React currently doesn't have the ability to have these things tree shaken anyway. Oh, yeah. um, And it's honestly, it's actually not, not a ton of code for lots of these things. And yeah. it's really unlikely that you're going to have, um, have any act like real world application that wouldn't be using all of these um, anyway. Yeah. Um, but if you are really like super worried about that, or maybe one day when React does have better support for tree shaking, if you do import star as React from React, um, then tree shaking will work. Um, it, in the event that React actually supports tree shaking for that uh, kind of stuff. Uh, right. Because then Webpack can take a look at that. It'll look at all the places that React is used. 
and it'll see all the used exports. Um, they, they're moving that way at all, do you think? Or sorry, what? Are they moving towards towards doing that? Um, I don't I don't th- know whether there are any plans. Um, but most of the stuff that is in React um, is it, going to be used in pretty much every app. Um, I can't really think of anything that that wouldn't be. Um, I guess like in the future, people aren't going to be using React Component because that's a, a class and, and maybe they build their whole app out of hooks, but they're probably going to be using third-party libraries that are going to be using that anyway. Um, or maybe React.memo, maybe they're not using that. So there could be some tree shaking opportunities there. Um, but yeah, that, that would be some, require some additional investigation. Right, like you think like some of the lifecycle class-based stuff might they might want to be able to shake that away if people aren't using it. Yeah, yeah. And my expectation is that in a year or two, I, I don't have any insider knowledge or whatever, but my expectation is that before too long, we're going to see um, class components uh, do the same thing that the create, create class API did, where they extract all that code into a separate package, and then they release a code mod to auto-update your code to use that package so yeah. they can get that code out. Um, I, I can see a future where... They do the same thing for classes so they can get that code out and, and just if you want to use it, that's fine. It still works. You just are using a different package for the classes. Right, right. And, and hand, hand rolling those libraries or a library is, is actually going to be more efficient than tree shaking could ever be anyways. But yep. Yep, exactly. um, yeah, it's interesting. it looks like there's a, a couple of questions in the chat for you. I'll, I'll mention one other thing uh, about that, like why my preference is to use React. Dot, and that's because if I do import use effect from oops from react uh, and I, I'm happy using use effect and then I'm like oh I need to use state uh, now I have to go up to my import import use state and oh now I want to use reducer okay now I've got to go up here and it's just so much jumping around it drives me bonkers so I just yeah, yeah. stop for everything but Visual Studio Code has been pretty good about doing that but it's also overly aggressive sometimes I've mm-hmm. found so yeah exactly that's why I turned that, that feature off of yeah, the, yeah it's, bit, it's bitten me in the past yeah. for sure yeah <laughs> So uh, here's a question. Uh, when you talk about dependencies and hooks, what are you referring to? I'm not familiar with them in that context. Yeah, so um, this was more of an, uh, like, you're already experienced with hooks talk, so that's why I didn't really go uh, very deep into it. Yeah. If you want to go learn about hooks, then my recommendation is um, go first read the docs, but then also my hooks and suspense playlist that I linked earlier in the chat. Um, and it'll give you a really good intro to what hooks are and what those dependencies mean. Um, but the dependencies is just this array. Um, that's the second argument to use effect. Yeah, the things, things that can change in between calls to your, your render function there yep. is basically all those are. Um, so there's a question for me <laughs> to say, uh, how come we don't use RxJS with uh, React as much as we use for Angular? Well, it's the... The simple answer is Angular depends on RxJS because they, they wanted to use observables for a lot of their, their asynchronous primitives. And React is wild west. You can use whatever you want. So uh, you're not going to see as much Rx because it's not been handed to you, I, I think is the, the, the main reason. Hmm. So obviously, being who I am, most of the React I see some is, has some Rx in it. That's the reason I'm seeing it, right? So. Um, so I've seen plenty, uh, but uh, I would I would imagine that that it just has to do with uh, the React ecosystem being being what it is. You, there's a variety of different ways people build React apps. Let's see what else? Um, are there any other questions in here that I'm missing? I don't see any other. No. So. I, uh, I was, oh, I wanted to, could you elaborate a little bit more on uh, what goes on in, in React with, with unnecessary re-renders? Um, so I was, on, I was always under the impression, and this is because I haven't looked at it in a really long time, but uh, what happens is uh, the render gets called, it obviously builds, builds out that tree of virtual DOM or whatever you want to call it, and that tree gets diffed. And, and is, are you just, do you just mean that when the diff comes out, if there's no changes, then... Uh, we're not touching DOM, so it's it's efficient in that manner, or is there some other uh, mechanism at play? Yeah, so um, I had a, an article that I actually ended up removing 
because uh, it was confusing people. Um, but uh, here, let's see if I've got a, a link to the code sandbox thing right here. Okay. So um, we have this little um, this little app that um, has a well. I think this is like the finished version. No, oh, okay, yeah. So um, it has one component for calling, making it increment the count, and then another one that uh, displays that count. Uh, increment the count actually doesn't need to re-render ever um, because it. Uh, um, it's always going to be rendering the button. Um, the event handler even is going to be consistent across renders. Um, but I have this little counter here that says whether it's uh, the render method is called. And it is being called every single time we're um, incrementing the count. Um, yeah, this, this demo has probably um, got a couple optimizations in here too that I should probably fix. But anyway, that's, that's the idea is an unnecessary re-render is when uh, there are no changes that actually need to be made to the DOM, but the render function is being called anyway. Um, and uh, a lot of people are concerned about that for performance reasons. Um, and most of the time, those people haven't actually measured, um, and so they're, they're just worried about it um, from a paranoid perspective, I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And uh, and it's not a problem. Does that yeah. answer your question? I know. Sure, sure. Of, yeah, yeah. I just yeah. I just thought I'd get you to elaborate on it. You, usually, if the things people are worried about being being a bottleneck is not their bottleneck. They should measure. Yeah, they have other things that they should be worrying about. Yeah, right. <laughs> like right. uh, loading too much JavaScript in the first place. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's that's usually a big one. Um, okay. Well, it doesn't look like uh, we have any other questions, and I want to make sure that Taylor has enough time. So. Taylor, you uh, want to take it away? All right. Um, let me see. Kent, can you unshare your screen? There we go. Thank you, Kent. That was an awesome presentation. I loved it. Thank you. Good luck, Taylor. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, let me see. All right. Can you see my slides? Yes. All right, cool. All right, so um, just a little bit of an introduction. Uh, my name is Taylor Alexis. I am a front end engineer and the founder of CodeEveryDay.io. And it's a platform that I'm building to provide um, developers from non traditional backgrounds access to coding resources, mentorship, and interview prep. And my talk will be on React accessibility. So um, I will be providing different like, libraries and um, techniques that you can use um, to enhance accessibility of your React applications. And I'll also go a little bit into how to do the same for uh, Gatsby. If you hear um, <laughs> like sounds, um, th there's people downstairs, so uh, sorry about that. But I'll, I'll also go a little bit into how to um, improve or enhance accessibility in your like Gatsby application um, or React Native, just a little bit. Um, so yeah, uh, what will you gain? From this, uh, like I said, you'll also, you know, you'll be learning a little bit about how to implement um, accessibility best practices in your React applications. Um, I'll go a little bit into Reach Router, um, what it is, and um, I'll also be starting off with uh, just a little bit of introduction to web accessibility for those who are not aware um, or who are just learning. So yeah. Let's see. So what is accessibility? Accessibility is making sure that your user experience um, is based accessible for people who are, who have uh, disabilities um, or like vision impairments, for instance, um, if you're colorblind, um, if you have uh, vision issues, you can't like see um, like small fonts or anything like that. Um, and you would use uh, tools such as assistive, assistive, <laughs> assistive um, technologies, such as like a screen reader to like navigate through the website. Um, so yeah, accessibility is a priority, not an afterthought. Um, the reason why I wanted to include that quote is because um, oftentimes as when I've, um, I guess from like my interactions with like other developers, they see accessibility as a hassle um, and it's a nuisance and not so much of a priority, but they forget that they're neglecting a large portion of the audience who 
may have accessibility issues. And they also forget that the person that they're working with, like right next to them, could also be disabled. Um, and so that is why uh, we try to advocate for accessibility um, to make sure that everyone um, is able to have the same user experience. So. Um, so here's a quick breakdown of the most common acronyms. Uh, A11Y, you may have seen that um, on social media or in an article. Um, that actually uh, stands for the amount of numbers that are in between the letters A and Y in the word accessibility. Um, and then ADA is the Americans with Disabilities Act. AT stands for Assistive uh, Technology. And then one or I189 or <laughs> Um, I-1-A-N, that actually means um, internationalization, and that enables uh, support for, like language support for your website. So making sure that um, the content translates to different languages for people who don't just speak English or who may not speak English. So, um, so here are a quick uh, few tips um, for accessibility um, to just like quick ways to like test accessibility of your application you can do keyboard navigation, which is tabbing through um, your website, like the forms and um, menus and everything um, to ensure that I can be able to like access the content and click on the elements and everything without having to like use my mouse or anything like that. Resizable text um, is just ensuring that I can um, resize the font so I can increase um, the font to be at least like 250% um, so I can be able to see and everything. Color contrast, um, there's actually quite a few tools that are for that. And basically color contrast means um, making sure that the background color doesn't interfere with the text color. Um, so there's like enough um, contrast between the two so then we can be able to like read and um, properly see your website. Um, there's actually a couple tools um, that I found recently that you can start using like right away in order to test that. Um, for instance, there is a, let me see, uh, where is it? I'm trying to show it. Um, yeah, where is it? Um, there's actually, um, it's actually a color contrast checker in your Chrome DevTools that you can actually like check out. It's probably like the most like immediate one. Um, there is also a website called colorsafe.co um, and that provides accessible color palettes that follow the WCAG guidelines. And the WCAG guidelines is um, a set of like rules um, to follow um, to ensure accessibility in your application. You can access that online. Um, I know for sure the website that I always use is the A11Y project, um, and that's where you can find like um, the guidelines and more. Um, just a checklist to like make sure that you're, um, to kind of keep you accountable as you're building out your websites. And there's also a website called accessible-colors.com, and that also tests the ratio of your colors. Um, so yeah. And then also um, another um, accessibility tip is consistent menu navigation. Um, and then always providing like text alternatives to like your images, your videos, and your audio. And the tools that we'll be going over um, in the talk will actually uh, include that um, in tests like, for instance, um, like some of the plugins and the tools that I'll be showing you will print out a message, like an error message, if um, you forget to include a text alternative, so. All right, so um, I'm going to show you some of the tools for the React um, application accessibility. Um, so yeah, a brief overview is um, basically uh, the key, um, in my opinion, to accessible React code lies in semantic HTML. Um, and making sure, uh, that's where it all starts, is really just in semantic HTML. Um, and JSX supports JSX accessibility. Support. Oh, I just heard myself. <laughs> um, it, can you hear me? Can I think? Yeah, I can hear you fine. I okay. I don't know what that was, just feedback, I guess. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, so yeah. Uh, a quick tip is notifying the user of errors. You can include like little like pop-ups or modules um, 
to uh, just like help um, the reader of your website um, know what they're like navigating through on the website. So you can use like dialogues. Um, you can also use like speech to text. Um, there's a lot of feedback, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, another key to accessible um, React uh, websites um, lies in your forms and making sure that you're being as thorough, descriptive, and as transparent as possible. Oftentimes, when we code as developers, uh, we forget to um, be as descriptive as possible um, because we already know like what um, we want, like the elements um, to do, and we want to like portray and convey to the user. But um, it's always best to like use um, like plain, um, understandable like English or whatever language that you're translating to as much as possible. Um, all right, so now I'm going to go over some of the uh, accessibility tools that you can actively use right away for free on your React application. So we'll start with React um, A11Y really quick. Um, it's very deprecated, um, basically it's no longer used. Um, now it's being, uh, React Acts is actually being used in favor of it. Um, but it's basically the same thing. Um, it just, it helps you um, identify like accessibility issues in your React elements and then it prints them out in the um, console in your um, Chrome DevTools. Um, now we're gonna go over the React X. And React X is a pretty thorough um, tool that you can like use to ensure accessibility in your application. Um, just like uh, its predecessor, React A11Y, um, React X prints out the tools, or not the tools, but it prints out um, the issues and possible solutions that you can use um, in your Chrome Dev tools. Um, so uh, you would, it basically like analyzes like the web page and it prints out in the Chrome Dev tools the issue, and then also prints out like the um, error, like the level of error. So um, it starts off with like a warning. Um, basically, like a warning message is like, it's kind of like optional for you to, to change or to like um, update that particular like code. But um, it's just a way um, to, I guess, kind of remind you to be more um, mindful of implementing best practices. Um, but it's not like a like mandatory for you to like change that particular element if it only prints out a warning. But it, like it goes up and up and up. Um, so like where like you would need to, like the level of severity um, goes up uh, depending on how bad it is. Um, and also uh, how you would initialize a uh, React Acts in your application is by just importing the module in your index.js file. Um, and then that's, that's easy. Um, just from there, you can uh, start um, getting like errors in your um, code. Um, yeah, and then we have ESLint plugin JS A11Y. And with that, um, it checks the accessibility of your code just like the other one. And it's built in to create React app, which we often use, right? Um, like automatically, but you can um, actually uh, change like how, um, how strict you want it to um, give you like the error messages. Um, when you do import it, or when you um, go into like your index.js file, or actually, my bad, you're supposed to, um, for a of functionality, you have to create an ESLIN file. Um, so uh, with that, let me see, um, with ESLIN, um, it actually, uh, it tests the final render DOM, such as, just like React X, um, and it, like I said, it helps find, you know, um, and fix any accessibility issues in the application. Um, and then the issues, because you include it in your ESLint RC JSON file, the issues will pop up as you code in your text editor. Um, and then the most you can switch to is recommended or strict mode. Depends on um, how mindful you want to be of your accessibility as you code. Um, in the warnings it'll print out could be like alternative text or images, like for image tags. Um, just like I previously stated before, um, to always like make sure that you are um, creating like alt text um, for your images and your audio and everything, those kind of files. Um, this plugin will literally tell you to do that, um, to remind you. 
Okay. <laughs> um, uh, another thing is that it tests the final output. Um, well, React Acts actually tests the final output. And um, how it does that it's by how it does that is by adding a React wrapper around the X core testing tool. But make sure you don't include that in your production bundle. And so yeah. Um, then we have React Aria modal. And um, that controls accessibility concerns like the keyboard focus I was talking about earlier, um, are your roles, um, just making sure like you write more like semantic code um, or semantic HTML. And it always ensures their model is accessible for users. Um, and it's recommended by the React team. So pretty good recommendation. All right. Um, oh no, wait, wait, why did it, wait. Oh no, my slides. Mm. Okay, all right, so now I'm going to give a deep dive into how Gatsby.js, which is a popular um, static site generator that uses a React in the front end and GraphQL for the data management, um, I will be going into how they implement best practices um, in Gatsby so then you can start um, writing accessible code like right out the box for your applications. Um, so by default, um, by nature, uh, Gatsby produces progressive web apps. Um, so um, that means that it prioritizes user experience from the jump. So that means that there's fast performance. Um, there's less reliance on JavaScript. So um, people can be able to access the um, content anytime on your website without having to worry about JavaScript or anything. Um, it's very fast. Uh, and it's also, um, for the most part, like offline ready. So um, courtesy of service workers, which basically like caches the files um, and making sure that so you can be able to access the files offline. So that really helps people who may not be in the best area, um, have like the best like network service or anything, or may not be on Wi-Fi or anything like that and can't access like the websites, like I can't access the website like online, they can still be able to like um, get access to your contents offline. Um, and it has Reach Router built in, and Reach Router is a more accessible, uh, more accessible alternative to what was the industry standard for um, building out your navigation, which was React Router. Um, and basically, um, the Reach Router manages the focus of your app on route transitions. Um, Something you have to do about it. There's easy lamp reading, and um, there's a 70% smaller bundler size than React Router, um, and so it just like helps like you produce like more like fast applications as well. Um, and let me see. Um, all right, and then um, for React Native, well, actually there is a I think I forgot to include a plugin. Wait, why does this still go? Hold on. Um, let me see. Okay. Um, I forgot to add like ESLint plugin JS, um, JSX uh, A11Y. Um, that you can, there's also like an alternative for Gatsby that you can use, um, and it's called Gatsby plugin React X. Same thing. Um, it integrates React Acts for um, accessibility testing. You just add it to your Gatsby config file, and um, it just like React Acts, um, it prints the accessibility warnings to your Chrome Dev tools. Um, and uh, here's a few React Native accessibility tips. Oh, okay. Um, a few React Native accessibility tips um, is to use um, these properties um, that I found on the React Native um, doc website. Um, they're pretty thorough with, um, or they become more thorough with their um, commitment to uh, accessibility. And so here are some of the properties that you can use, um, such as the property true. Um, it's a way, so I can see like my, Hold on. Wait, why is it? I'm sorry. I was gonna try to um disable my like notifications. 
you might see a whole bunch of like switch notifications. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so uh, the property is true is a way to indicate a view is an accessible element. Um, then there's accessibility label. So people who use voiceover know what element they have selected and will be, and it will read the element like out loud, um, which is pretty cool. Um, I just like learned about this. Um, I'm learning React Native right now. So uh, I figure for those who are also learning React Native, maybe they can um, just uh, keep, be mindful of like these certain properties. Um, and then accessibility hint. Um, and this actually is a pretty cool way of, it lets users um, understand what will happen when they perform a certain action, when they click on a um, certain element, um, an accessible element. Um, so yeah, uh, this is pretty much like wrapping up. Um, just a few uh, questions to keep in mind as you're building out your React application. Um, are you using semantic HTML? Is it easy to navigate your website? Can I tab through your application? Um, is there good color contrast in your color scheme um, for your UI? Um, and then can I access the files um, offline? And then another thing is just for general accessibility, um, there's other tools that you can use, um, such as Microsoft's Accessibility Insights or Lighthouse um, X. And there's also a couple people that you can follow um, on Twitter, for instance, who always uh, give pretty good like advice on accessibility. Like um, there's one named Codeability. I'll um, when I present like the slides um, on my uh, Twitter page, I'll also include like a link of people um, to follow just in case. Um, so there's one named Codeability, um, and he provides like really great advice. It's also Marcy Sutton. Um, these are people that I'm learning from. Um, this is how I got introduced to accessibility is through them. Um, so yeah, uh, I think oh, you can also use the um, Axe Chrome um, extension. You can just install it um, to your um, web browser and go on any web page. This is a great way that I learned about accessibility is that I installed the Axe Chrome tool and um, it analyzes the web page, and then it gives you a list of accessibility issues and how many times the issue occurs on the page, on the web page. And so when you click on the issue, it provides a detailed description of where um, this element messed up and how you can improve it. Um, and also provides a level of, uh, level of severity. So as you can see, there's kind of a pattern. Um, Axe has really put out a lot of really great tools um, for your accessibility. So, yeah, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you, Taylor. Thanks, Let's see. I uh, just want to see if there's any questions in here before I get to asking questions. Let's see, there's a, there's a question. Are, are all of the great accessibility features just being rolled into React Router in version 5 plus? Can, wait, um, can you ask that again? So the, the question is, are are all of the great accessibility features just being rolled into React Router in version 5 plus? And then he goes on to ask, uh, and should we be using Reach Router or React Router for projects that need to be relevant next year? All right. Um, so the first question, I do not know if it's gonna be, um, if there will be like any accessibility enhancements for the um, version five. But I would say personally, you should use Reach Router because there's accessibility like built into it. Um, and that was like one of the priorities when the person who created, I believe it was Brian Florence. Um, that was uh, the reason like why he created like the reach router and everything. So I would say that you should in future projects um, use reach router. And if you're using Gatsby, it's already built in. Um, so yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see, uh, another question is, I've been using H1 to H to like header tags for uh, to, sim to simply be d different font sizes, is it bad for accessibility if I use something like an H5 for a caption on an image since the caption isn't really a header? So, okay, so the person's asking if, um, the, if it's okay to use like H5. Yeah, basically, for, for like, can you, yeah, I think to, can you use uh, HTML in a, in a not semantic way to, or is that bad? Um, it's, I guess um, that would be like up to them to decide, I would suppose. Um, I would say that you should follow semantic HTML regardless. Um, and to, like even the things that you consider to be like 
mind you, or like little, um, that can cause like a big issue to a user, um, regardless for like, and especially for captions. Um, so I would try to use like follow semantic practices for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think I agree with that one because it's not like the, you, you, the, the readers are going to actually look at the tags to decide what is what, um, mm -hmm. And the, the style means nothing to, to a screen reader. So at least to my knowledge. Um, so yeah. All right. Uh, so let's see, I, I actually have a, a question. So you, you talked, you were starting a, you're talking about starting a business for, uh, to help people with non-traditional backgrounds, um, uh, get started in tech. I'd like to hear more about that. And I'm, I'm curious if working in that area, uh, is what got you interested in, in uh, talking about accessibility or if, if there's some overlap there? I like that question, Ben. <laughs> um, so basically the reason why I started Code Every Day is because um, I was, uh, I had shared my story on Twitter um, about how I got into tech and just briefly um, how I got into tech was that I was in um, fast food and retail and I was teaching myself how to code um, every day like after work um, using like online resources. And I would often tweet about it um, because I was following the 100 Days of Code Challenge. And then so um, when I did land a job, a lot of the questions that people always ask me was, can you mentor me? What resources did you use? Um, and how did you get into tech and how can I do it too? And so I was like, all right, so instead of just like, just like answering like every question individually in the you know dms or direct messages um i was like how about i build a platform so that everyone can get access to it and um when i had went to uh i believe it was microsoft build um that no it was a microsoft build actually it was cascaded js last year it's when i met um marcy sutton and um she was pretty badass honestly like when i met her she seems like really like passionate about like, developer advocacy and accessibility and that's when i came across accessibility um and so uh actually a core focus for my excuse <laughs> um a core focus <laughs> that was like a 2008 throwback um, <laughs> okay so a core focus for um code every day as i'm building a platform is like making sure it's a pwa and making sure it's accessible um and that actually falls in line with the purpose um is helping make tech accessible for everyone um and helping uh, lower the barrier of entry and because i remember like when i first came across coding because i did not know about computer science or programming until um like 2017 i was 21 never heard of a day in my life and like i thought like oh that's what mark zuckerberg does like you know that's what mark zuckerberg does and i'm not smart enough i can't do it and that's that was so wrong but it's a common assumption you know it's a very very common misconception and so i want to kind of get rid of like misconceptions and i want to target um like underrepresented like people minorities um really like everyone non traditional you know people from non traditional backgrounds um and help guide them into this um, cool tech space and help improve the quality of life and everything because it helped me. So that's the reason why I started it. That's great. That's awesome. Thank you. So when, when can we expect, is that already launched now or is it, is it you're still working on it? It's in the works. It's in the works. Okay, um, okay. Actually, I'll be giving a keynote um, at Rice Speak Code next week in San Francisco um, where I'll be talking about um, the process of me turning it into a startup and me launching the platform. Um, and so the MVP should be launched um, by that time. That's my plan to kind of release that. Um, and so uh, right now we have a Discord and I believe we have about 500 people and we have a newsletter and we have about 2000 subscribers right now. Um, and the newsletter basically I feature people who are in their journey because um, I've really been like, you know, investing in the community and everything. And so I'm always like finding people and I want to try to like, you know, shed spotlight on them. And um, I think they're watching soccer downstairs. I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I think they're playing FIFA or something. Are, are, they, but, uh, are they posting about soccer on MySpace right after? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Probably Instagram. Probably on Instagram Live, like dorks. But, um, uh, what's it called? So, uh, I lost my train of thought, but yeah, like the newsletter, um, 
it basically like features like uh, like resources that people can use um, that I find that are free, um, and I give like reviews on everything like that. Um, and uh, so yeah, the newsletter's out. Um, and so we, yeah, we have uh, we have someone asking in the the chat if you can post the the how they can get into the newsletter or or. Okay. Cool. Cool. Um. Yeah. So. Uh, on the screen is, I think my screen is still showing. You can go to codeeveryday.io and you can sign up um, to the uh, mailing list and everything. And then you can start getting access to like the newsletters. Um, and so, yeah, so codeeveryday.io. Um, next week, the MVP should be released. Um, and so you'll be able to get um, access to content and everything. And so I'm working on that, working on that um, pretty heavily. Um, we've been hosting a few meetups. Uh, so. Basically, as you can probably tell, like I've been doing like more like the community building for right now, like um, prior to like the launch and everything. So we did a meetup in New York and that was pretty cool. Um, I was pretty happy. I co-hosted with my friend Hero, um, who's actually the founder of AWS Newbies. Um, so she helps get people like um, introduced to uh, AWS. So um, yeah, and uh, I plan on uh, actually giving a talk at a school in Oakland um, pretty soon um, and helping uh, reach out to like minority um, kids and everything about um, getting introduced to computer science and then hopefully they can um, use Code Every Day as a resource. So yeah, that's what I've been doing. Um, yeah. Well, that sounds great. Uh, we'll, de yeah. we'll definitely be looking for that. Yeah? OK, cool. All right. So it looks like there is one more question, uh, and it is, do you have any rule of thumb on what specific HTML tags to use for texts in divs slash spans? Uh, for example, um, should they always be wrapped in a P tag, et cetera? Um, the answer is escaping me at the moment, but I know W3C Schools probably has the answer for that. I, mean, um, for the, I think for the most part, the, the Axe tooling will, will catch a Axe. lot of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like the tools that, um, that I showed today should um, be pretty useful for people. Use like the Axe Chrome um, extension, you can just install it like right away. And um, that's actually a great way to start learning. It's just go on like different websites, like go on Twitter, go on MySpace um, yeah. or anything and just find errors and then that's how you like learn. Right. Yeah. Learn. If if you if you set something up in your development pipeline that complains when accessibility isn't being met, it will do what everything else has done in your life as a programmer and punch you in the face repeatedly <laughs> until you learn <laughs> not to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like, oh, I typed bad code, you know, early on. I I still do all the time and it and it, you know, you get the errors and eventually if you after you see the same error enough, you you remember not to do the dumb thing again. So all right, uh, Eva, I'll let Eva take it away. I think we're, we're about 15 minutes over or so. We are. I let it go long because you guys were having a good time uh, yeah. conversation, and it was really interesting, so I wanted to get all of it. Um, but thank you, everybody, for joining the call, and thank you to our lovely speakers, Taylor and Kent, and thank you, Ben, for jumping in and helping with the co-hosting. I'm glad I did. Both these presentations were awesome. They were really cool. So thank you guys so much, and we'll